Greetings and uh, welcome to another edition of Beyond the Headlines. Uh, I'm Glenn Smith. I'm the watchdog and public service editor for the Post and Courier. And joining me today are uh, two of our senior projects reporters, uh, Tony Bartlemy and Jennifer Barry Hawes, uh, both of whom have worked with me on our Uncovered series. Uh, I want to remind everyone before we get started that the event is being recorded and it will be sent out after the event. Uh, with contact info in case you have any more questions. Also, uh, I'm going to encourage people to uh, submit questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we will try to get to as many questions as uh, we can in the time that we have. Uh, in, an un in a recent Uncovered story, we shared that federal corruption prosecutions are, are way down, both in South Carolina and across the nation. At the same time, we discovered that newspaper closures have cut coverage and investigations into government uh, for people living in pretty much every corner of our state. So in response to these findings, we ask ourselves uh, what happens when watchdogs disappear and who is stepping up to fill that void? Uh, welcome Jennifer and Tony. Ho hopefully we can uh, have a good discussion on this topic. Uh, Tony, we'll start with you. Uh, you wrote the story about federal corruption prosecutions uh, declining uh, both here and across the nation. How did you get onto that story and how were you able to quantify this trend? Also, more importantly, what does this mean for the public in terms of holding government officials accountable? Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we, uh, we began, began, um, um, we began, began looking, looking at, at uh, some of the some data, of the data uh, um, uh, early on. Early on it, we really wanted, really to, wanted understand to understand kind of what was, what was um, you know, you know, what was the, what was scope, the scope of corruption, of corruption in, in, South in South Carolina? Carolina? And, and what, was, what was, you know, who were the who traditional, were the traditional watchdogs? watchdogs? And what were they doing? Were they doing? And, and so we began, so we as began, we began to look deeper into it, into it uh, I stumbled on a bunch of data, data, data from, from the Justice, Justice Department. Department. It's their public, their public integrity, integrity section. section. It's, they're the traditional watchdogs that, that go after, so, so the corrupt politicians. And I quickly discovered that there was this big decline in, in these investigations over time. So then we began to look a little deeper. And uh, then I came across this other uh, outfit called uh, the Syracuse Track Program, where they obtain a, a larger universe of cases involving corruption. And a lot of academics use, use this data. And Again, I kind of we we spent a little bit of money buying the data, and we 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 uncovered what we think is a national trend, what, what clearly is a national trend, and and that since the late '90s, there's been a, a noticeable decrease in the amount of uh, federal investigations into corrupt public officials. It's actually dropped by half since the late '90s, and so we thought, you know, nobody's really talking about that, and and it's incredibly important because the feds have long been the most one of the most important corruption fighters. So we, um, we started to try to understand the kind of the dynamics, why uh, the feds have backed off. And, and we've uh, come up with some pretty interesting uh, conclusions in that regard. We think it's a national, national story that, that has really flown under the radar. What's, what's the impact of that, you think, to the general public? Why should the public be concerned? Yeah, so you, you think about it, the, who are the are maybe the most who have who are the best crime, corruption crime fighters out there? They're, they're they're people who have a little bit of an outsider status, and that's what the feds bring to the table. They they come in, uh, they aren't less beholden to the um, you know the kind of the local community in in some ways. They you know the, you know their budgets aren't dependent on uh, on maybe the the mayor or the city council or county council. So they're able to. They're able to come in a little more objectively, and if they are changing their priorities, you know who who else is going to fill that vacuum? So far, it's really hasn't been filled yet. Okay, Jen, we'll turn to you. Um, newspapers have often augmented that watchdog role, uh, watching out for the state's public or for the public's interest in meetings and investigating tips for possible wrongdoing. What, what forces are conspiring to diminish that watchdog role for newspapers and, and what sort of a toll is all that taking here in South Carolina? Well, there's been a number of things that have conspired to affect newspapers over the past decades. And one of the biggies is that 
uh, newspapers have seen drops in uh, revenue from advertising in particular. So if you think about if you're looking for a job or you're looking to buy or sell a house, uh, you much more often turn to the internet for that than you do from like classified ads and those sorts of things. And newspapers used to uh, rely on to help um, pay their bills. And also for a while now, um, we've seen increased competition from things like cable news outlets, online news sources. There's all kinds of, of ways people get their news now. Um, but in South Carolina in particular, we've seen um, an increasing divergence between um, cities like Charleston and Greenville and Myrtle Beach that have seen big uh, increases in their population um, versus small rural communities that have been seeing uh, their populations, populations decline. And so um, with those declines, we've seen industries close and businesses close and, and those were things that once uh, advertised in the local newspapers that now are gone. Um, once helped keep those lo you know, very local newspapers afloat that are not there anymore. Um, and the result of all that is that newspapers, generally speaking, have uh, fewer resources. And so if you have fewer resources, then obviously you have less money and uh, manpower to go after the kinds of uh, corruption Tony was just talking about. You know, it takes money to pay a staff member uh, a reporter uh, to spend months going through documents to look for corruption. It costs money uh, to pay Freedom of Information Act bills, um, which some agencies uh, use as a way to make it a little more difficult to get information. These things all cost money. And so as newspapers have had fewer resources, you tend to see that watchdog role diminish. And just keeping the light, lights on costs money. How, how many papers in the state have closed just in the last year alone? Well, when we looked at last year, uh, we saw that 10 had closed in South Carolina, and that appeared to be at least a modern day record. Uh, some of that was due to coronavirus, which played, of course, a particularly big role uh, in some of the more recent closures. But those those trends I mentioned earlier have been ongoing for some time. But we we found 10 that had closed in, in 2020 alone. Okay. Tony, you've been working on Uncovered now for about a year. What sorts of corruption are you seeing around South Carolina? And, and can you talk a little bit about the corrosive effects uh, these acts can have on public servants and the public's uh, trust in its institutions? Yeah, I think so. We, we've seen just this, this bu buffet of corruption across the state, uh, you know, ranging from, you know, from simple kickbacks to more elaborate schemes. And yeah, you know, you know, I think it's really important to you know remember that that it's easy to be cynical about this you know the, about corruption and and easy to be oh just say oh you know they're all bad you know and and I don't I don't think that's the case I think there are a lot of honest honest public servants and I think the important thing of, about what we're doing and in in uncovered is exposing the bad actors so the good actors maybe can can do something and and I really think that's kind of our our purpose in in doing this but yeah we're. We're, we're fine. Everything from, yeah, just conflicts of interest to these sort of gray area issues where people make these bad decisions. Um, I'm really interested in, in why people make bad decisions because I think that's really the key to understanding how to, how to fix the problem. Yeah, and I, I, one of the things I, I was surprised by is I think, uh, I mean, we've certainly seen some big ticket big ticket items where somebody's walked off with a million dollars or more like the, the former uh, Berkeley County school finance guy. Um, but so much more of these, of these just, I hate to call them nickel and dime things, but they're, they're pretty small, right? I mean, it's like a thousand dollars here, some money out of a, you know, clerk's fund for child enforcement or the guy in some town not turning in the proceeds from uh, scrap metal deliveries or th things like that. It's small stuff, but it just er erodes, erodes the institutions over time. Yeah, and, and it's those small stuff, you know, if you talk to fraud experts, it's it's the fraud, the small stuff that leads to bigger stuff, because that's kind of how fraud works. You begin, oh, you begin to cut a corner and you're not caught. So you do a, a little bigger corner and pretty soon you you you're you're talking tens of thousands or, mi or millions of dollars sometimes. Yeah. So, Jan, you spent weeks traveling around the state documenting the struggle of small town newspapers. Uh, tell us a little bit about that experience. What struck you the most about these outlets and their plight? And, and how did these newspaper folks react to, uh, you know, having the tables turned a little bit and, and having themselves be the subject of news coverage? 
Yeah, they were all really good sports. You know, I think for a lot of these small town journalists that we talked to, um, I, I sense that there was some relief, really, that they could tell their stories and um, and address some of the misunderstandings that people have about how newspapers work. You know, um, these are very, very local newspapers. They're not CNN or Fox or even the New York Times or the Washington Post. This, these are very um, community oriented journalists. And um, I spent a particularly long time with a place called the Union County News, which was a two man operation in Union County, as you can imagine. Um, and these two journalists had started this newspaper years ago because they wanted to provide better local news to their area. Um, and they're super hardworking. You know, they did everything from write the stories to take photos to laying out the newspaper, getting advertising, delivering the newspaper um, for not very much money and working a lot of hours um, purely to serve their communities. And uh, they, you know, they live in these towns. They uh, go to church with the people they cover, their kids play sports with the, the children of people they write about. Um, they're really just focused on serving the community. And I think they really wanted people to understand that um, because a, a lot of times local journalists get lumped in with national political reporters in particular, whose coverage, uh, you know, some people think is biased um, or is erroneous. Um, but these local journalists operate so far removed from the world of New York and DC and um, LA that it's really hard to overstate. And I think they wanted to communicate that, you know, they're covering high school sports, they're covering graduations, they're covering um, school board meetings. Uh, they're really, they're just wanting to serve the community. Uh, and, and I think they really just wanted people to understand what they do a lot more uh, than the average per person out there probably understands. Yeah, I was thinking when I read your story uh, about, you know, Union obviously was the site of uh, the, the awful Susan Smith tragedy. And, you know, what happens if a, if a paper's not there for something like that? I, I suppose that story was su such a big national thing that, that other outlets rush in from all over and you probably get that covered, but, but maybe not the local high school basketball game, right? Or, or the local council meeting, uh, voting on the budget or tax increases. It's, you know, it's a slippery slope with that sort of stuff. Um, Tony, a ma major part of Uncovered is working with uh, smaller outlets to help them produce stories about possible uh, misconduct in their areas. I'm interested in what that experience has been like for you and what you've learned from all this. Uh, can you give us an example of, of that collaboration, uh, how you worked with one of those papers on a stories uh, story and uh, what the impacts have been? Yeah, the, I think working with uh, some of our partners has been incredibly gratifying and, and illuminating and really just maybe uh, one of the best things that uh, I've experienced in my career. And uh, in, so part of it is um, it, it, it involves understanding kind of what their world is like. And it's sort of similar to our world, but they uh, many of these community reporters are so... Um, they're like air traffic controllers. You know, they, they're going to a fish fry here and then they're going to a sports event here and they're so busy and so dedicated. And, and then, um, so they don't often have the time to really dig deep or know how. So one of our great um, collaborations has been with the Greenwood paper where we did a, um, a hard look at the governor's school uh, up in McCormick County to the agricultural school at John De La Howe. And so I had a lot of time to work on it. So I, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at spending records and, and all sorts of things. And we uh, worked a little bit with the Green, Green, Greenwood Index Journal uh, early on because they had the kind of the local knowledge. And then we produced a story and one of its um, uh, reporters and editors, um, Matthew Hensley, uh, took that ball, took all of our reporting and then started building his own base of reporting and, and was, with that, our kind of the foundation that we were able to provide, he just took it so much farther, so much deeper. He was energized. I was energized. It was just a terrific, terrific uh, group effort. And, and there's really been some uh, hard looks at that school from from state agencies and, and leaders because of that, correct? 
Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, multiple watchdogs have taken a look at it. Um, it's been kind of gratifying for us because you know, the state auditors looked at it, the inspector general looked at it, and all of them confirmed what we had found originally, despite the denials from the school saying, oh, everything's fine. No, no worries. No problem here. Nothing to see. Um, clearly, there was a lot to see, and there's probably more to look at. Yeah, without giving too much away, I know we're, we're planning, planning more on that school and, and stuff in that area. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, Jen, you've spent some time in Allendale, South Carolina, which is our state's lone, like, true news desert, which means that there are no local news outlets uh, covering the community at all. So some people, some outlets come in on occasion and write about stories that there's no one uh, based there, no one has been based there since 2015. Um, you had a fascinating piece that detailed how concerned citizens, uh, gadflies, if you will, have stepped in to fill some of that void um, how did that story come about and how did how did their activities come about and how have their efforts been received by that local uh, government there? Well, we focused on Allendale County uh, for the reasons, like you said, they don't have a local newspaper there anymore. So it's it's one area that we could look at to really see, well, what happens when uh, newspapers shrink or go away? What rises uh, into that void? And uh, we found a, a couple of categories in particular of people. And one was uh, these kind of hyper-partisan watchdoggy type people who come in and are, are um, sort of presenting themselves as watchdogs, but they're really presenting a, a political viewpoint. And on the other hand, you had what we called gadflies. And these are citizen watchdogs who really are operating much more in the journalistic spirit of, of asking questions and requesting documents, um, wanting to expose wrongdoing for the good of the community. Um, but they aren't selling a particular viewpoint. And in, in Allendale County, uh, there was a really interesting one there, um, gadfly named uh, Angel Brabham, who was doing a lot of great work uh, at the county council level, really trying to expose um, significant problems in the way the county was handling its finances. And she became um, very loud and present about it um, in a very professional way, though. Uh, she essentially went to all kinds of public officials, eventually got the attention of her state senators and even the governor's office uh, and put enough pressure along with some other uh, residents in the, in the county to force them to uh, undergo a forensic audit that exposed a whole, a whole wide range of problematic financial uh, maneuvers that the county was uh, engaged in. And so her work exposed something that had been going on for a long time, but because um, people were not motivated to change anything because they didn't have the pressure that uh, the journalists can apply, um, it was just going on and on and on. And, and I think it's a really good example of where you may have people, uh, whether or not there were people who were up to no good remains to be seen. Um, SLED is investigating the findings of the forensic audit now. Um, but there definitely were county officials who um, just were being sloppy and lazy and not um, handling finances the way I think most people would expect their officials to handle them. And that was clearly the result of, of people not watching and therefore the public not knowing. And so what Angel did was come in and, and make it, she created a Facebook page um, that made it impossible for people not to know what was going on. She kept them abreast, um, did the kind of things that a journalist would do um, uh, as part of the normal course of business. Uh, and so these kinds of gadflies like Angel were popping up in communities where you're, particularly where you're seeing weakening newspapers and providing a really important service. Okay. Yeah, the thing in Allendale, I know it struck me too, since 2015, uh, when the Allendale Sun closed down, there, there have been three officials there um, arrested on embezzlement charges, and uh, the state school department came in and took over the county schools for the second time. And those were the things, I guess, that grab, grab headlines elsewhere. But as you discovered in that audit, I mean, there were things that were really pretty suspicious, like this uh, fund that the sheriff had set up that uh, it, nobody seemed to know about where the money was coming from or where it was being spent on. I think we still don't know uh, that, correct? That's right, and there and there were all kinds of examples like that. For instance, the county had had um, many many um, bank accounts opened 
um, in its name or officials' names that, that seemingly county council didn't know about. Um, there were instances where the sheriff was spending money uh, and not providing receipts for where that money had gone. Um, the clerk came under fire for paying um, bonuses out of a um, out of a special fund. There was just um, lots of things going on that weren't being properly documented, and so therefore, who who knows where the money went? Um, but to your point, those things are still outstanding. Like I said, SLED is investigating it. Um, the friends of God, it gave the county council plenty to work with. There, there definitely are several county council members who seem to be, um, they seem to not really know what to do, but they seemed uh, to want to improve the situation. I think they're really seeking guidance. Um, one of the, the officials who came up repeatedly for criticism was the county clerk uh, who has since resigned and there's a new clerk in place. Um, so Angel and a lot of the residents there are really hoping that she will be much more forthcoming about the county's finances. The old clerk, for instance, was not providing the county council with um, uh, with financial statements about the uh, county's revenue, something pretty basic that you need to create a budget and understand the, how much money you have on hand. Uh, so a Angel was key to helping to um, press that issue, which had been an ongoing problem, but county council had just not addressed it. Um, and now that clerk is gone. And so the, the residents, like I said, are hopeful that um, that the new clerk will step up and um, and fix that situation. So there may not have been anything corrupt in what the um, what the treasurer was doing, but clearly she was not providing the information that the council needed to operate the county efficiently. If you don't know how much money you have on hand, uh, how do you figure out how to pay your bills? Okay. Let's uh, turn uh, to some questions from some of the readers that they submitted ahead and some questions that have come up today. We see we got a few on there. Uh, throw one to you, Tony. Um, I saw a couple of people mentioned in the lead up to this, sort of the concerns about media bias, uh, particularly at the national level. And, uh, you know, in an age of social media, how, how do people sort of figure out who to trust and, and uh, State and local reporters seem to have had more trust from the public. Do you see that continuing? Why is it, why is it different at the local level? And why should people have faith in their reporters at the local level? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's nice to hear that there is more faith in, in reporters at the local and state level, just speaking from a biased standpoint as a lo local reporter. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, you know, I think there's some, there's a, a connection that we local reporters have with the community that is a little different. You know, we we bump into the people we write about all the time. We, you know, we, we have that 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 personal connection, and which means we also have that feedback. We get that, you know, if we are if we were biased about something, we will hear about it um, quickly. So I think there's a sort of a self-checking mechanism that local reporters have. And that I think allows us to, again to kind of we know how important it is to have these connections in the community, how, how, how sensitive it, um, so many issues are for the, the people. So I, I really believe that that's, that's our sort of saving grace. Um, and also, I, I also it, it helps for a lot of people to understand that, you know, Tony, you know, or Jen and Glenn are not going to write a story on our own. We're not a, we're not a blogging operation where we just crank something out. We, um, when I write a story, you know, Glenn and about 10 other people are going to look at it. And if I, if I'm biased, if I do something, you know, you know, that is sensitive or biased, you know, they're going to stop that. So there's that, again, that great sort of self-checking mechanism that I think we have um, in our favor. Okay. Uh, people also express concern in the lead up to this, again, with the, the age of social media and some of the market pressures to bear. Jen, you, you talked about that earlier on, uh, things that have d d contributed to the decline of, of local news outlets. Um, but, you know, old saying is you don't miss what you have in, until it's gone, right? And uh, I don't know, take a place like Ware Shoals that we visited to. Tell us a little bit about the impact of that newspaper uh, disappearing from that area. Uh, one of the 10 that went under last year uh, during the pandemic. Um, what, what has been the, the after effect of, of losing that uh, local connection? 
Yeah, I think that that's really important to think about. And when people decide whether or not to subscribe to their local newspaper, uh, I, I hope that they take this kind of thing into account. Um, where Scholes, I'll give you an example. There was a man who talked about how um, he had moved from the community but kept up, up, kept up with what was going on uh, through the local newspaper. And um, someone he knew had passed away, but he didn't even hear about it until um, after the, the man had already been buried. And he felt terrible that he hadn't reached out to the family, hadn't gone to the funeral, but he just hadn't known about it because he didn't have something as simple as, as the paper to look at obituaries. Um, somebody else described um, not holding um, an event at church because they didn't really know how to alert the community to the event. Um, another person described how the local paper normally ran a photo of the graduating high school seniors. Um, and, you know, people would clip it out and put it in scrapbooks, hang it on the refrigerator, but they didn't have that because nobody ran that photo uh, last year, um, or I guess earlier this year. Uh, and it's those little things that the newspaper provides that maybe you just take for granted. Um, it, that all of a sudden, if they're gone, that kind of the way we tried to describe it in the story was this community glue is gone, that those newspapers, especially in small towns, really hold a community together with common information. Um, and, and their goal is to provide that information, um, not to provide you know, biased accounts and inaccurate news. They're there to provide people news that they need to know. And, and to Tony's point earlier, um, you know, that's really important. And those people are accountable to the community. You know, we all live in the communities we cover. Um, I've lived here for 20 some odd years. All three of us have. Um, you know, we, we, we're not going to be irresponsible or try to mislead people based on our coverage. And that was certainly the case in the, in the small towns that I visited. Um, and I hope people think about that. And again, I hope that they think about what would be lost um, when they ponder whether, you know, to fork out the, um, you know, I think it was $37, $36 a year the Ware Shoals paper charge for yeah. a subscription at the end. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really not, not a large amount of money to support something that's very important to the community. Absolutely. Uh, a couple other questions. I, I'll, I'll throw this one to you, Tony. Uh, these are, I'm going to combine two questions here because they're sort of a, of a similar theme. Uh, is there a danger of being too close to the community? And have any of the subjects of your investigations tried to pressure you or your bosses uh, to prevent you from pursuing these investigations? Yeah, that, those are great questions. And, and Wendy, I appreciate that one as well. Uh, uh, you know, so first of all, have, have we had any pressure? You know, I'm actually surprised that we haven't had more. You know, you would think that you know, we're kind of going after people pretty hard that they would try to, you know, talk to our bosses and try to influence. I haven't experienced that. Um, in the, in, in fact, I've really throughout my career, I've had moments where I've done very, very sensitive stories and our um, leadership was uh, incredibly supportive. I've never had a story killed um, because of, you know, it was too sensitive. Um, you know, it's so I, I can really... Fortunately, I'm able to say that we have a really great track record. Now, Gerald, Gerald's question about can we get too close to uh, the community, I think is really important because yes, that can be a huge problem and that will blind us to what's really happening. And the, the only way to, to prevent that is to really sort of be true to your journalistic roots and write stories without fear or favor. Keep that in mind in everything you do. I mean, we're just I fortunate. Would, we have we have great we have great editors who keep us honest. Yeah, I, I think uh, I underscore that point to Tony too, because I mean I you know been a reporter here and worked here for twenty something years, and I can't recall ever being told not to do a story or being pressured. Uh, and I've certainly not pressured anyone to, to lay off something because uh, of someone I know. I think again, it takes. Because you do have friends in the community, right? You do have uh, connections. Your kids' school or 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 you know, people you meet or play softball with or things like that. Uh, I think what you have to do in those, those instances is what you'd like to see more government officials do is recuse themselves from those discussions. If uh, Tony comes to me and says, I've got this amazing story 
about this really corrupt person who's done some bad things. And I'm like, oh, geez, that's a, that's a good friend of mine. I'm going to steer as far away from that story as I possibly can in editing that. I'm going to push that to somebody else to look at because I know I got a bias. I've got you know, a personal relationship there. And that is not going to serve the story or the community well to, uh, to, to try to do that on my own. So really, really good questions. Uh, Jennifer, what role do you see citizen journalists playing in the effort to expose possible corruption, especially in the absence of local community newspapers or professional journalists in the rural areas? Well, there's been a, there's been efforts around the country to try to train citizen journalists more to cover meetings, for instance, and provide some basic information. Um, but I, I don't think that that citizen journalists ought to be a replacement for journalists. I think what they can do is some important work um, where there are news deserts. Um, but but there's something that a journalist brings to the table that I would not want to say. Um, that that an average citizen out there will bring. And it's not that they're not able to bring, but there are ethical issues to mind um, that journalists have been trained in. Um, there are the kinds of things we just talked about um, that are often issues for citizen journalists who know the people involved and are very close to some of them. Uh, I, I don't want to imply that I think they're a replacement for, but I do think that citizen journalists can play an important role as far as um, asking questions, seeking documents, um, pressing issues that are important. And I see that that being more important in some of the rural communities that have um, shrinking newspapers. Um, there, there are a couple of outlets nationally that are trying to train people into understanding, um, for instance, how to do a basic background check on someone or how to report the basics of a meeting. Um, those sorts of things. But I, th I would like to think that those things kind of go uh, those things rise up as a part or as, as two parts of a whole in terms of providing information, not um, not a replacement for. I would still love to see people subscribe to their local newspaper and um, have journalists cover the meetings. And in Allendale, for instance, uh, in neighboring um, Barnwell County, uh, a journalist actually purchased the newspaper from Gannett and is operating it there and is beginning to expand out his freelancers so that now there's a a freelancer from his from his newspaper who's covering Allendale, which is great. So I think you also will see um, new papers rise up in some of these communities, and hopefully we'll see more of them. Okay. Uh, an attendee also asked, uh, can you give uh, the average concerned citizen information about how uh, to search for specific uh, corruption on councilmen and, and others? I, I will say, uh, if you go to, I think uh, Mary behind the scenes here is, uh, just put out a link to our Uncovered series. Uh, if you go to that page, uh, we actually put together a citizen's toolkit for how to uh, request information through the state's open record laws and what to do uh, if officials are trying to go behind closed doors improperly. There's a number of tips, uh, forms, links. Uh, they can help you pursue your own investigations. If you don't feel up to that, I would suggest give us a call. Uh, any, uh, any of the three of us here would be happy to look into tips. That's what we're here for. Um, we have a database now of, geez, well over probably 80 tips that have been received by the, from the public since we started this. And, and we've been diligently going through those. It's taken us a little time to finish them out, but we're always happy to add to that list and, and keep looking. Um, let's see. One more question here uh, for either of you. Any thoughts on how to increase the availability of local newspapers or should we legitimize some type of social media that is believable to local people? Yeah, I think uh, uh, social media is, is the, and the, there's a problem with the, the lack of, of, of layers of filters and, and, and oversight. So I, I don't know, I, I don't wanna legitimize social media. I think that's a real problem. Um, I would say just subscribe to your local paper, please. We, yeah. we, we write for food. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I'd urge you if you want to look into some of the dangers of social media. Tony did a great story about a year ago about the researchers at Clemson uh, looking into trolls uh, who were manipulating um, coverage of issues, trying to stir up trouble in our community, trying to stir up all sorts of division, uh, posing as, as, as different folks that supposedly were here. 
So there, there, there's a dangerous uh, aspect to all that. Okay. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for watching today. I think we've run out of time. Really appreciate these great questions. Uh, remember that you can sign up for any of our free newsletters at postandcourier.com slash newsletter dash sign up. Uh, if you're a subscriber, we'd like to say very, very much thank you. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, you can sign up at postandcourier.com subscribe. And we always, uh, you know, appreciate donations to our investigative fund too. That's really helped. Um, Power Uncover and allowed us to uh, request, make a number of open record requests and help some smaller papers do the same. Uh, again, thank you everyone, have a great day and uh, we'll see you next time.